All right, so first up, there are a lot of announcements, uh, as you can see. Uh, so reiteration on the accommodations announcement, uh, Project One Checkpoint is due today, in fact. Uh, and the first project is due next Friday, which is the 25th. Uh, there is no class on Tuesday next week. It is a Monday schedule. So remember to go to your Monday classes, assuming you have any. Um, the last thing I want to point out is there is some extra credit available if you're interested. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, we're looking for more faculty for the computing and data sciences uh, faculty at BU. As part of that process, each person comes in and uh, gives a presentation about their work and what they're doing and stuff. Uh, some of it is very accessible and really interesting. So um, what I was thinking was that if you go to one of these talks, um, and the reason I kind of say before March 4th is because the, the series that I think you'll find most interesting is the ones kind of upcoming. Um, but we'll drop your lowest homework score if you write a paragraph or two about what the talk was about. All right. Um, does that make sense? All right, so hopefully it'll be interesting. The one I saw on Tuesday, which is the only one I've been able to go to, um, because uh, you know it's it's weird for me to be in a lecture and attend to talk at the same time. So, uh, but that one was super interesting, uh, and so hopefully they might be interesting for you. Uh, obviously, we'll post the slides, uh, you know, as soon as the lecture is over, so you can pull the link if you don't type it in now. Um, that's it. Yeah, so for this class, we don't actually, conveniently, we don't have any office hours on Monday, so, uh, but normally they would be uh, that same schedule on Tuesday. But I think for this class, uh, we don't have office hours that day anyway. Um, do you have office hours that day? Oh, you do, okay. Okay, but you're gonna do your Monday hours on Tuesday? Okay, I mix up classes. So look at the Monday schedule for the office hours. And those will be the hours for Tuesday. It makes sense. So it really is a Monday. All right. Any questions? All right, cool. Start strong with a question. Um, what's the keyword that starts a function? Or a method, if you prefer that word. <laughs> All right, last couple. I'm calling it. <laughs> All right, looks like def was very popular, which is good because that's the correct answer. Uh, so like I said uh, in the lecture sometime before now, um, if you think of def as short for define, that's a good way to think uh, to remember if that's how you start a function. All right, so moving on. Um, we want to talk about this guy, Sir Francis Dalton, um, who basically pioneered the idea of making predictions um, and uh, you know you're kind of really well known for that um, and we're going to talk about some of the data that he used that uh, is kind of how he led to doing this stuff um, and however he had a, a particular interest um, in heredity and that's kind of what led to doing predictions and stuff like that uh, however if you if you look into him at all he also had some very questionable ideas around heredity and what it meant. Um, but we're mostly talking about the fact that, you know, can we predict a child's age based on the parents, for example? Um, and, uh, you know, kind of a fun fact, he it was uh, Charles Darwin's half cousin. Um, and so, you know, maybe there was some influence there, right? Because uh, Darwin obviously also very interested in heredity. Um, 
And if you want to know more about him, there's a Wikipedia link uh, and, and why uh, I say that some of the things that he talked about or thought were pretty questionable. All right. And here we have a uh, random factoid about Sir Francis Galton. And if you notice, it says, just because I misread it the first time, uh, what fact about Sir Francis Galton is false. All right, let's uh, call it there. And looks like we had pretty good results. Uh, so he was his, what did I say, half cousin? cousin. Um, but he did coin the phrase nurture versus uh, nature versus nurture, uh, which I think is often like misattributed to uh, Darwin himself. Uh, but he created the first weather map, and that is a lot of writing. Uh, 340 books and papers. Uh, and he was also referred to as, um, which we don't, you don't see as much anymore, um, but this concept of a polymath, which is basically somebody who has a very strong interest in multiple subjects and is an expert in multiple subjects. You see it a lot less these days because each subject in, you know, for like a major in college or whatever, is so deep now. We, we you know, when you're standing on the shoulders of giants, those giants are so tall it's really difficult to be an expert in multiple subjects. Um, but some people do manage to do it. It's really impressive when they do. So talking about prediction, we'll jump kind of right into uh, the notebook. Um, it should be there. Uh, I think I moved it over there this morning um, for you to be able to follow along. Hopefully, eventually, I'll be able to follow along. Let me just I forgot to the settings here. All right. So, but before, huh, that's not supposed to be there. Um, so that's not supposed to say prediction yet. So I wanted to cover a couple more things about functions uh, before we moved on. So, and then we'll go to predictions um, in just a second. But yeah, my uh, my labels in this file kept getting moved around. I think I must have put it there by accident, like I moved it by accident. All right, so if we want uh, a method or a function that takes multiple arguments, um, it's really easy. We just list names for the multiple arguments. Does that make sense? Um, and as I showed in the lecture last time, um, you can also give those default values so that people don't have to fill those all in. Um, but what I want to ask you is, um, how would I write this function? So the first thing I do is I make sure I have a colon, right? Because I forget that all the time. Um, and then I'm just going to call or give a name here. And as you can see, the, the math is above, right? Um, the calculator the about is to get, uh, you know, the height squared uh, is equal to the x and the y squared. Um, or the length squared. And so what do we what do we do to, to put that in Python? Anyone? What should I type next? Yeah. Asterisk? Yeah, asterisk to asterisk. Um, so, uh, it's, because that word is ridiculously hard to say, um, asterisk is often just referred to as star by programmers too. Uh, so you can, if you uh, if you say star, I'll usually know what you mean, even though um, it doesn't really look that much like a star. So, okay, so now I've got that in that variable. What do I do next to get it to the outside? Yep. 
Sorry, I'm not looking around the room very well today, apparently. Um, but do I want to do anything to it before I return it? Oh. <laughs> What is it? I'm going to write something really questionable by accident. <clears throat> any any other things I need to do? Yeah. Do you remember how to do it? Right. So you raise it to the half power, uh, and that will give us the square root. So now I'm going to run that. Now I have a method called hypotenuse, um, and I can call it just as if it was a, you know, a, a single method, right, or a single uh, parameter method. However, we just, you know, separate with commas. Um, you know, obviously we're going to get back a float because we're doing, uh, you know, kind of more complicated math, and so it's switching into a float, and then, but now we can kind of you know, fill it in with anything um, and get uglier answers, for example. And, and that's that. All right, any questions? Could we use what? Oh, so yes. So there, there are a lot of times functions built into various Python libraries that I'm not using for, for this class, um, especially common things like square root. Um, so yes, almost always. There's probably even a hypotenuse somewhere. Um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm showing it as an example, not because it's necessarily the best way to do it. All right, any other questions? Okay, so now I wanna introduce you to a new function. But in order to do that, I want to first create a table. And if you recall, right, we use the width columns method. And then we give it two, or basically give it a label and an array, a label and an array. And we will get back a table object uh, that has those columns. So that's all I did there. But then let's write another method. And this is what we're going to call brilliantly cap at 1980. So in other words, we're going to say, okay, don't give me any birth years that are after 1980. And again, we just return, return uh, min x 1980. So that's just going to kind of throw out those values, right? And so we always want to test everything we write. So we're just going to say cap at 1980. And we're going to give it one that we think should come back correctly. And then, oh boy, wrong button. Then we want to do one that we think should not work. And it works correctly, right? So, you know, if we pass a value that's over 1980, it's going to give us back 1980, pass it under, it's going to give us 1980, or it's going to give us the original value. Um, and so will this work if I pass in 1980 itself? What will I get back? Any other guesses? You don't seem real confident. I'm not sure if it's the first one. Right. So, we're using min, so therefore there's no kind of inclusivity, exclusivity. It's just looking at these naturally and saying, hey, uh, you know, I've got these two numbers. I'm going to return one of them that's low. So when you're testing a function like this, okay, that's kind of why I pointed out is it's usually a good idea to do kind of one under it, right? One over it and one that's equal to it to make sure you've got all use cases covered. Sometimes I'll throw in a negative two just to make sure, especially if it's complicated, a negative or something like that to kind of further exercise. Is it doing what I expect it to be doing? Um, so now we'll show you a new function. Oops, maybe if I can type it. Um, 
So what this function does is it lets you apply a method to a column. So what I can do is I can say cap at 1980, and that's the name of the method. And uh, I can give it a column name. And we can see the output, which you know isn't isn't super pretty, but and it's just going to give us uh, you know all the ages are now below 1980, right, or earlier than 1980. Um, a couple things to point out here, which I find confusing. Okay, when you're passing a method to it. It's not in quotes, right? So it's like a variable. That's kind of what I was saying. It's like methods are kind of like variables. But you notice there's no parentheses, right? You don't pass it any values or anything like that. Um, and then this, you know, this part I think is simpler, right? But you give it the column that essentially you want to apply, uh, you know, in this method too. And so what's going to happen is this method here is going to take this one and just give it each value of the columns, okay? So in fact, you can give it more columns if you have multiple. And so, why don't we do a multi-column one, but I'm going to cheat a little and cut and paste so that this doesn't take the rest of my natural life. Uh, sorry, I need a couple more spots. Okay, so we now have another function that is going to give us back the name of the age. Okay. So it's going to do the age by subtracting the birth year from, or whatever we pass in for year, right, from 2019. Um, and then we're going to say, probably let's make that 2022, but whatever. Um, and then it's going to give us back a new string uh, that, that kind of formats it a little more nicely. And then we can use the apply function. And give it two columns. So one thing to notice, right, is you always will get an array back from apply. Okay, so even though I'm returning a string here, I, that string is embedded in the array. Okay, uh, make sense? So that is a very handy method. So just kind of keep that in mind, file it away. The kind of thing that will show up on midterms. Yeah. <laughs> Not using that function. So what you would normally do if you want to solve that problem, and basically the question in case somebody didn't hear it, right? Was, uh, can you pass multiple methods to the same one? What I would probably do for that scenario, because it, it probably wouldn't make a whole lot of logical sense to actually do multiple methods. What I would actually do is create a new method that calls those in turn and then use that method here because it'll probably logically make more sense ultimately anyway. Any other questions? I thought I saw somebody else with their hand up. No? Okay. All right. So now back to our regularly scheduled programming and actual prediction. So first thing we're going to do is load that data table in that we have provided, right? And so this is the table of data that Dalton created, um, or very similar to it. Um, and I want to point out a little bit about how this thing works. Okay, so if you notice, this, these four rows are all the same family, okay? And so that means that they have four children. Make sense? And so the way you tell is because the family number is the same, it also tells you there's four children, but that information is like repeating, right? So it's not terribly useful. But this one or the two is what indicates that, of course, we have two sets of four families. Oh, but this one's a two. Um, it tells us the gender of the child, and it tells us the father type, the mother type, and then the mid parent type. So what's the height that's in the middle of the father and mother? And then what is the child's height as an adult? Okay, so even though it says child, they just mean that person's kid, but when they're 20, right? Go ahead. Sorry, what's the family? Like, why did multiple ones multiple 
This is one family. Oh, one family. This is a second family, both with four children. So this is just the average of the two parents. So it's the it's the middle of their heights. Because Dalton had a theory, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but Dalton had a theory that that was predictive of the child height. Yeah. What's on? Yeah, that seems right. I think it's test taking. No, now I'm questioning myself. Um, but so is it the average average or the median? Oh, don't worry about it. We'll get to it in a bit. Um, any other questions? We're going to talk about this a bunch more and then like a whole bunch of times in future lectures too. Uh, this is probably the most common set of data you'll see in this class. Um, so let's see. So the first thing we want to do when we look at a new data set is we want to try to get a sense of, of the data set. And so what this is going to tell us is a histogram of that mid parent height. Um, and it shows us that a lot of the parents, right, are kind of right here in this range, right? That's what this histogram tells us is that the outliers are, are you know, the very short people, and there's outliers that are really tall people. But here's the kind of middle this is the bulk of the people, it's mid parent height. So then to kind of keep going, we can do a histogram with the child's height. And so the only problem with this being blown up is it's hard to, it's kind of hard to see two things at the same time. Um, but so, uh, you know, if you kind of note the ranges, right? So it's 55 to 80 inches uh, and 64 to 74 in, or 75 inches. Um, but if you notice the the children height is kind of like a little bit more all over the place, right? Than the the mid parent heights. Um, so that's the reason I pointed out is because it's it's kind of something to notice, something to think about with the data set, right? Is like, you know, do you have any theories about why that might be, et cetera? Um, and let's see if we have. Nope, I'm going the wrong direction. Where's my mouse? All right, so as I was saying, it's a little hard to see if we try to kind of scroll back and forth. So what we can actually do, and I'm gonna cut and paste this so I don't make too many mistakes typing it, but I can actually put them both on the same histogram. Okay, so this does two things. One, when I'm projecting in class, means you can see them at the same time, but also shows the relationship between the two sets of data okay so those mid parent heights you know are kind of like right in here and then the child heights are like a little bit skewed off of that which is kind of interesting but then we can do more stuff where we take essentially we do almost exactly the same command except this time let's do a scatter plot let's see I got next here. So we'll mess with that in a minute. So if we do a scatter plot, now we can see them in relationship to each other, right? So this is mid parent height cut off at the bottom, child height over here, right? And so we can find any row by kind of looking at the X and Y to an individual dot. Okay. So this tells us again, kind of shows us another way of looking at kind of the relationship between those those two sets of numbers. And what's always interesting is like what we're looking for, right, is is can we do prediction stuff here? Yeah. Is it possible to give the two separate dots of different colors? So yes. Um, the part, sorry. Yeah, there you can. Uh, we're not going to do it today, though. So, yes. Um, like I said, I tend to uh, do kind of the simplest version of it. Um, but what I wanted to point out was if we start to notice 
that we can look at, sorry, I feel like I'm off on slides. Hold on just a second. Okay, so what we can do is we can say, all right, let's let's figure out how we might go about trying to do some predictions, right? So how would we know if we had some arbitrary height for the mid-parent height? How could we guess what the children's height might be? Anybody have a, an idea? What what might be a theory for how you can do that? So I know what the parent's height is. They have a kid. Can I predict how tall that kid will be based on this information? Do you know how? Very good. Uh, okay, so. I'm going to put it in slightly different terms that are what the words we use normally for this kind of thing, but you're essentially after. What if we take other people who have basically the same height and look at the height of their child in the past, right? So what we call them is neighbors, okay? Or sometimes also nearest neighbors. So if I know that, let me scroll this down just a little bit. So if I know that the mid-parent height is 68 inches, then it's likely, right? You would think it would be a good guess to say somewhere that their kid is gonna be somewhere between, let's say 60 inches and 73-ish, right? Because all the other ones are the same, or they're, they're all in that cluster. So I know maybe I know a range for what that, the height of that kid would be. So what I can do is I can start to take the averages. So if I have um, a parent, let's say there were 68 inches as the, the mid-parent height, right? Um, so what I can do is say, okay, are they, let's take a little bit of a window because we don't necessarily want to say exactly 68. Maybe we'll say kind of half an inch around it. Then we can say, okay, let's look at the child height, but let's look at the average height of the children for parents that are in this range. And that we're just going to call that nearby mean, right? Because we basically we're looking at the children that are nearby. And so our guess could be that that kid will be 66 inches approximately. But then we can get a little cooler. Let me just see what's. Yeah, so then we can actually put that on the graph itself. And let me just kind of point out, right? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to put our two lines in, which is what we did here, right? So just putting in a line that's red um, and it's going to go kind of up and down here, right? And then another one over here. And then we're also gonna plot along with our scatter, we're gonna plot the nearby mean, okay? Or that number we calculated up there at the 68X. Okay, so basically we're using the scatter to do a normal scatter, but then we're saying, hey, put this dot in there too, okay? And so this seems to be a good guess for the height of the kid that is born to a parent or a set of parents uh, that were uh, between them were on average 68 inches. Does that make sense? All right, so that's cool. But what if we now wanted to do it kind of for arbitrary values, right? So we would write a function. So we're going to call that brilliantly predict, and we're going to give it as an input of height. 
And then we basically do the same thing we did before to get the initial one. And then turn. Sorry, I, I will go back to color commentary as soon as I finish typing this, hopefully correctly. All right, so oops, let me just scroll this so you can see it a little better. Okay, so we're going to write this prediction function, which is what it's going to do is it's going to do the same thing we did above to get that 66, except we're going to generalize it a bit, right? So we're going to say whatever height you pass in, let's subtract a half an inch and add a half an inch. Okay, now we're going to find all the parents, so all the rows that are in that range, so in that vertical range like this. Okay. Then we're going to go and find the actual height and take the mean of that. You know what another word for mean is? And if you say jerk, I will laugh, but it's not very. Yeah, average. Average, right? So um, this is, I think, one of the very confusing things that you see in, in software development. Um, both mean and average are often methods and they work the exact same way except if you pass in certain parameters so it can be a little weird for the vast majority of the time um, average or mean whichever one you use will be the same the other thing is that average will almost always be because lazy shortened to avg okay so just if you see a function avg it's just average just the same as mean just that mean actually lets you do a little bit more sophisticated averages that we don't care about. Okay, so I don't think I actually ran this. So now if I pass in my original 68, I get a 66 back from my method. So now I've got this cool method that will predict the height of kids based on the mid-parent height. And let me just scroll a little bit. And, you know, as usual, I like to try some examples that I didn't know the answer to going in kind of. Um, and so we try it with 70 and that seems to work. And we try it with 73 and that seems to work. Well, if I spell it correctly, it does. All right. So now what we can do, or what, what does everybody here think, given the, given the content that we've done thus far today, what do you think we might want to try and do with that? Oh, sure. Ah. I will try not to kill myself on my bag today. You want to see the function? Okay. So given what we've done today, what do you think I might try next? Yes, but we need a step before that. How would I add the column? I, I may have mentioned a method where you can. Uh, no, the one. How do I make the column? So this is where we can use apply, right? Oh, sorry. Was that what you were going to say? Um, so we can use the apply method and apply predict to the entire table, right, or the entire column, really, and get back an array. Oops. Oops. And so now that's going to chunk along a little bit, right? I mean, I don't know if you, you all saw the delay, 
because it's got to go now apply that method to each of those uh, mid parent heights and get back a predicted height for the children. Right, so this is not their actual height, this is their predicted height. And to your point before, why is this interesting? Because now what we want to do is look at the predicted height versus their actual height to see how good our predictions are, right? And I apparently should have turned off output scrolling on that one. So, as we were discussing, now we can actually start that column into our table. Um, so now we have the, where is it? Uh, the actual child height and their predicted height. And now what we can do is we can do an even cooler graph by oops none of those are commas All right, so I'm going to do another graph. Um, what am I doing with this select state? What is this going to do to the table? Just those columns. Why would I want to do that? Yes, but there's a, an even like easier reason. Because I can't put male and female on a scatter plot, right? Like their text, they're categorical. So I have to limit it to at least numerical or column, right? That's what I meant by like easier. So, all right. So now I'm going to scatter <laughs> So actually, before I move on, the reason I bring that up particularly is because, at least for me, one of the very common mistakes I make is they forget that there's categorical data on the table. And so I run scatter and I get an error. So when you get an error that says, you know, I can't project column blah, it's because you're trying to project categorical data onto your scatter plot. And not only does that not work, it also doesn't make any sense. So, like I said, I make that mistake all the time. That's why I point it out. So now, what's kind of cool is. I did the scatter plot. So now I have my mid parent heights. I also have them kind of the dots where the ch child actual heights are. And then you may not be able to tell the best. Then I put a yellow dot everywhere there's a predicted height. Okay. Which, if you look at this, and this is what I was saying in the back, you may not be able to tell. This is not a line, it's a whole bunch of dots. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody understand what I did there? Okay. I think we go to slides here. Yeah. That one, this one. So we want to do a minor digression here. Um, and I don't know, maybe I can place it differently, but we talked about looking at documentation before. Um, and what I wanted to do was try to show a practical example. So that is not the right thing to be dragging around. Um, why does technology not work when you need it to? Let me know. So, oh, I didn't want to start with that one. I want to start with. Uh, the other one, where'd it go? Oh, oh, it did work. So if you go and take a look at those links, you have all kinds of documentation about how to use these various things. So here is like a tutorial, but what I like to use a lot is actually 
the straight documentation, which, there we go, this will work, which tells us all the methods that are available and what they result in, okay, um, and how they work. And so this is in that data science library, which basically, you know, we may not have gotten to it yet, but we'll probably use most of the features of, of this library. Um, but then there's another one that we also use a fair amount, which is literally monstrous, and that's called NumPy. Okay, and when I say monstrous, like as in huge, and it does a ton of stuff, and it's heavily used by data scientists and machine learn, uh, learning specialists and programmers and everybody else. Um, so it has a ton of stuff, most of which we won't be using in the course of this class. But just got to be aware it's available. And if you're not sure about how something works, this is where you go find the answer. Okay, so those links will be in the slides and you can get to them uh, later. But do you have a question? No, okay. All right. I still don't understand what Top Hat does to my computer. All right. So what we were talking about was making a prediction. Now we want to look at the accuracy of that prediction. I thought we had a, a, a little bit more of a slide in between, but I guess I was mistaken. So we'll move on from there. Where did my other window go? All right, so the next thing we want to do is try to figure out the accuracy. So does anybody have any theories how we would figure out the accuracy of our predicted height versus the child height? What would be a good way to figure out what, you know, how, how good our, our uh, predictions are? Yes, but how do we know how close it is? What does that mean? Or, or that's cool. We'll get into that later. But uh, yeah, we just subtract the two, right? We, that tells us what the difference is, but gives it to us as a number versus like it's something that we can look at. So if we can get to the actual number, then we can do cool things with it. So we'll make another function. Well, there's definitely other ways we could do this one. Um, but for the sake of more examples of apply, we can just say subtract x minus y, right? And then we can apply our predicted height and child height and we'll get back a set, an array of the errors, right? So now here are the differences between what our predicted height is and the child height. Um, and to a large extent, let's see, I think I talked about this next, but let me just check. Yeah, so while we're gonna retain this, like we don't actually care whether the difference between them is positive or negative, really, right? We care, to your earlier point, we care about their, the distance from each other. We don't care if it's a negative or positive distance. We care about the fact that it's it's further or closer away. Does that make sense? So a lot of the time we'll throw out the fact that it's negative or positive. So that's why whether I do X minus Y or Y minus X doesn't matter a whole time, most of the time. So then I'll take the same thing and actually add it to our table. Oh my goodness, I should turn outputs down. Right, and so this is basically just doing the same thing. So now I have an array with all of our differences or errors, right? And we're gonna add it to our table, which is cool. So now we just have another column, but then we can do a histogram with the errors. And so now this tells us distribution of the errors between the heights of like the heights that we predicted 
and the heights that, of the actual children. So now we can see where that distribution is. Um, and you know, for the vast majority of it, it actually looks like it's it's pretty decent, right? It's it's close. A lot of the uh, results are are near zero, right? However, actually, let, let me ask this first. So a lot of the results are near zero, but does anybody notice anything that, that is, you know, it's not uniform, right? So what is, what is the, you know, what's the shift or whatever? Why is it not uniform? Not, not as in, don't tell me like an explanation for it, but like it leans towards the positive, right? So... Does anybody have any theories about why it might error towards a positive difference in this particular case? Like, exactly. So men in general tend to be taller than women. As a result, if you use a uniform prediction model, you're probably going to be off on your predictions because the men will be slightly taller than the women, uh, or even a lot taller, but you know, in general, they'll be taller. So let's say that's our theory. Here is a way we can actually check that theory, right? So as you can see, if the gender is female, the difference is quite a bit higher. Okay, so in other words, the prediction and the actual children height is, is quite a bit further when it's women. Whereas with the male, it tends to be slightly less, but it's, it's still an error, but it's kind of in the other direction. So basically, our prediction is doing a good job of kind of being in the middle and being and being wrong for both roughly equally, right? So, oh, but the, the big thing I want to point out, sorry about that, is that with the histogram, I'm going to use this new thing where I can group by categorical, okay? And essentially end up with, it's as if I had made two histograms, right? With two different tables and then laid them on top of each other, but I can, I can cheat. And in the history of, I can actually uh, directly say, choose this category and overlay it with this other categorical or with this categorical data, right? Which is the gender. All right, so if we wanted to fix this, does anybody know how we might go about fixing this? And I'm going to uh, not play Jeopardy music, but play a little Jeopardy music. Uh, please try this on your own. See if you can help and try to figure out how you might do a smarter prediction to get to this prediction. Or, sorry, to get to like it, be more inclusive of the gender differences. So we're not doing the whole prediction here, right? This is just one prediction. So like, don't worry about like the rest of the table or any of that stuff. We'll usually apply like we did before. This is, let's just make a new function that does the prediction that isn't just a straight subtraction. Oh, sorry, not subtracted, but it's three hours. So this is our old prediction function. What would we like to incorporate into that to make this a better prediction? You can have the checkers. 
Yeah. So we want to incorporate the gender into our prediction. So can you elaborate? Do you can, can you tell me code that will do that? And I'll start it. If I can find where I was, there's a lot of output scrolling. All right, so we still need a nearby. Yeah. Okay, so we have now the nearby. How could we incorporate gender into that? So if you notice, we added a new parameter here already. So what can we do with that parameter? Right on. All right, so nearby, and but we're gonna get another data set essentially. And we're just going to take nearby, but then strip everything that is the, the wrong gender. So now this data only has the same gender as the uh, sample that we're checking for, right? Or who we're trying to predict for. So to return that, because I think this is probably more obvious, nearby same gender, basically it's the same function we did before, we just did it with the new uh, data set. And we have to spell column correctly. I haven't run it yet. But we still have to take that average. Oops, I didn't realize I had two returns. Um, so now we have this new prediction, which goes and grabs the nearby like we were doing before. But then we're going to strip out everything that is not the same gender as passed in. And then we're going to return our average, you know, the average value thereby to be able to predict the height. So then we can actually run it. And we should get different results now, right? So now for the female with the 68 mid-parent height, uh, and for the male with 68 mid-parent height, we just get 62 and 68. Make sense? Then, I think I already have this here, yeah. Now we can add another column or another, at least in this case, it's an array. Let's see, where do I add it? Yeah, so I'm just going to show you this because it's a lot of typing. But so I do that same apply function, but now I use the predict smarter and I'm going to add that data set as another column onto our table, except obviously we're going to call it smart predicted height. Um, so now we know what the original child height is, the predicted height using the, the simplistic predictor those errors there and then the smart predicted height based on gender. And so obviously, what do we want to do next? Like, what, what's going to be the next useful piece of information? Right, so now we want to make sure that this error, right? So if we subtract this from this is a smaller number than that, right? Because otherwise, we didn't do a very good job. Um, so, in order to accomplish that, we basically just do 
we use, oh, sorry, we just do the subtraction. We use the same function we did before to get the errors before using the difference method. Um, and then I did want to point out uh, one thing just to note here. This you can completely ignore. Basically, um, this is throwing some warnings if you don't have this here. Uh, so if you get a warning, it'll still work and everything else. But that's what that's doing is it's just hiding the warning uh, because it's not relevant. All right, but now we can do another histogram, and that looks much, much better, right? Much closer because this is just our smarter errors. And as you can see, right, the males and females are about the same amount of error from each other. Okay, because that's why there's so much overlap. And if you notice, I think the, the actual errors are also tight. Right, so it is definitely smarter. Then I think, yeah, so then we're going to kind of move on to get a little bit more information about grouping. All right. And so in order to do that, we're going to go to a, basically a simpler data set, which is the just that cones table. Um, which that should really be one cell. Um, so this is just we talked about this before ice cream flavor, what color is the ice cream, and what's the price of the ice cream. But now we can do using grouping. So now, like we use the grouping in the histogram, but we can actually do it on a table directly. So we can actually do cones. This is also another thing that'll be really useful a lot. Is we can now group by any given flavor, right? Um, so now we know we have three different chocolate types, two different strawberry types, one bubblegum type, um, and we group it. And the group method, I think, is one of the things to remember about it, right? Is it's going to add a column with a made up label unless you tell it a label. Okay. So just kind of keep that in mind because you, you never typed it in, right? So you have to just remember that it's going to create a column called count. All right, but then we can also do slightly more sophisticated things by changing the method by which it's doing the grouping, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do in this example is we're going to drop the color column, this one here, because we don't care about it. And we're gonna group by the flavor but instead of doing the sum, which is the default, we're going to take the average value. So much like the apply function, we're going to pass in a method here that is what we want to apply to each of the uh, resultant rows, rows, basically. And so that way we can find out what's the average price for all three chocolate flavored ice. That make sense? So you can group by default and you'll just get a count or you can choose to use a function and that will do other stuff. Um, and that other stuff can be relatively arbitrary. So we can do the same deal as before. Just get rid of color, but then group with flavor and we can do, all right, What's the cheapest color? Like we actually don't get the result back, but well, you know, what's the cheapest flavor of ice cream we can determine from this is the strawberry. Um, and the chocolate and the bubble number more expensive. Make sense? Of any color. All right. Um, okay, I swear I fixed that. Uh, if you have this in the example, it is incorrect. And I know I saved it, so it must just not have saved. I mean, I know I changed it. It must just not have saved. But hopefully it's correct in yours. Um, is it correct in the sample? Oh, okay. Uh, so this is the survey that we were playing with the other day. Um, oh, thanks. 
Is that the year? I think the idea was right. All right. But now we can do things with our data set. Oops. And group by, say, Python. Um, however, what would be an interesting, so if I was looking at the survey data and trying to structure the course, right? What would be an interesting method I want to do? Because I don't, I don't want to count the Python, right? I know everybody in there is like gave some answer. So what might be a useful thing to um, group? Like what value would be a useful thing? If I was trying to figure out like how to structure the class and maybe want to give more Python or less Python help. No, sorry. So not another column. What operation do I want to do on the data element that's in the Python column? Average. Average would be useful, right? So so now I can look at the average of those, you know, up and like so what I can do is I can say, okay, here's this data set, and it tells me that the people who average out to be five are you know kind of look like this right and tell me a little bit more what they do so you know python people who said they're really good at python were really good at programming and there's almost a one-to-one -one mapping but not quite um I, I was hoping to discover that you know people with really good at programming also did the most text thing but apparently Okay, so just to basically simplify things, and I'm going to cut and paste this one, I apologize. But I can kind of do the same thing, but I can get rid of some of the data that is, you know, kind of getting in the way for, for what I want to show by dropping some columns. Um, and let's see. Let's do, oops. Then I can kind of do some nice graphs based on the data. Um, but the first thing I need to do is, uh, like I need to actually assign the grouped thing um, to a new variable, right? So then I can operate on it. I mean, I can chain all of those together, but it'll be confusing and likely to have bugs. So I tend not to do that. Um, but then I can first do a selection, but I'm just going to do it with numbers so that uh, it's a little easier um, instead of having to type out the whole names. And then I'm going to just plot all of them onto the same graph because I want to see. The same data as, as here, right? But uh, kind of as lines uh, to make it more understandable in theory. Um, we don't actually have anything particularly interesting there. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of correlation between it. Um, but you get the idea. Uh, it would be cooler if it was cooler, but I can't do anything about it being not cool. Um, Sorry, my next example is exactly the same as my first example, so I didn't want to, I'm not going to bother with that one. Um, so, like I said before, grouping is very, very important. Like it's really useful. You do it a lot. Um, so, you know, we kind of have this set of rules, as it were. Uh, so, the first argument is going to be which column to group by. And then the second argument, is how to combine the values uh, that, it, that it finds, right? Uh, so some examples, right, are the length um, and, you know, and the list them or, you know, sum them or we did average or min or max or, you know, whatever you can think of. Um, as long as it makes sense, it should work. Uh, it's not, the restriction is on whether whether the function that you're passing it can process the data, not some arbitrary restriction that says that you can only use these methods. Does that make sense? 
All right. Mm -hmm. right, sorry. All right, question time. Yeah, I thought I explained that badly. Wait, let's go back. Yeah, sorry. I yeah, I was reading this and getting confused. Um, Yeah, so those are different functions that you can pass in. Um, but this is not a great slide, so I will fully admit. Um, so uh, these are you know methods you can use, um, and what are you know what are they map to? But I should definitely revisit that slide because I think it's confusing. Ooh, we have five minutes left. All right, I'm going to call it there. Uh, so it looks like most people got it right. Um, you know, the, the big thing is like LAN is short for length. You'll use LAN all the time. It's something to commit to memory. You know, list is kind of what it sounds like. Um, and we're going to talk more about list versus like why we call it a list specifically versus like an array. Um, and then some is kind of what it sounds like, right? All right, yeah, so I think, let me just see how much is left. Yeah, I think maybe we'll push the next part to next time because we only have five minutes left and I don't wanna, I don't wanna start and get halfway into it and then stop. Um, questions, anybody? Yeah. For the talk, yeah, you know, like we'll post the slides to Piazza, like right after class. So you can see the, see the slides. Okay. Any other questions? All right.